I'm here with uh, Black Veil Brides lead guitarist, Jake Pitts. How are you doing, Jake? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm good. So I just want to start off by talking about your uh, new album that you guys are, will be releasing, The Restitch These Wounds. What made you guys kind uh -huh. of want to do this 10-year re-recording of your first album? Um, well, this has been something that we've talked about. I mean, we actually wanted to do it many, many years ago. And the the idea, basically, I think the original idea behind it was just that none of us really felt that first album, the the quality of it was really what we envisioned it being. Um, we were very rushed in a studio. We didn't have a budget, like hardly any budget to do anything. Most of it was all just done uh, by our manager, like pulling favors from people, trying to get us in the studio to record. And, and uh, so it, it was very rushed in the process of recording it. Um, we didn't have an actual mixer, uh, mixed engineer do it. It was just the engineers and nothing, nothing against uh, the guys that worked on the record, you know, but it just, it didn't have the, the amount of time that should have been put into it. So everything was a bit rushed, but it was our first album and there's something special about it. So we wanted to, I think, in the sense of bringing a modern production to it, uh, redo it. And it's been, we've been in talks about doing it for, for years and years. And then it kind of just became a thing of like, well, um, we'll get our, our masters back after 10 years. And uh, sorry, Gucci's over there doing some weird stuff. Uh, we'll get the masters back after 10 years and then we'll have the rights to redo it and re-release it. Uh, so we're doing that with Sumerian Records. They're putting it out. And uh, I got to produce, record, mix the whole thing. So uh, it's kind of cool just to be able to, you know, have it be, you know, 10 years ago, I didn't have the, the knowledge I, I do now or the, the skill set that I do now. So it's cool to be able to go back and, and re-record the whole thing and, and spice things up here and there and just overall give it a much better, modern and more matured sound. Yeah, for sure. And like over the years, how do you feel that the band has improved over the 10 years? Oh, I mean, I just think everybody's, uh, everybody individually has become a better songwriter, musician, more open-minded with music ideas, uh, better musicians. You know, Jinx has now scored, like done a score to a whole movie. Uh, he He's very, very good with the strings and the orchestrations of things. Um, Andy's vocals have improved. Like, I, I, I couldn't even tell you how many times. He just sounds like such a better singer now than he did way back then. And it's just because over time, you know, when you're doing something for so many years, you, you get better and better at it. And, uh, you know, Lonnie's a great musician. He's a, not just a bass player. He's a great guitar player, obviously, you know that. And, uh, you know, he's a very talented musician, very nice guy. Um, CeCe's always been a badass drummer. So um, yeah. I don't know if, if it was even possible for him to even get better, but he probably did somehow because his playing on the Reese Tissue's Wounds is absolutely insane. And I think it was particularly... Uh, fun and he was really stoked for it because he didn't play on the original recording so this was new for him this was like a new album for him because he never got to play play on the actual recording so of course we played the songs live uh for the most part but um yeah just everybody's improved overall yeah and like you said before you uh produced and mixed this uh record so how much fun was it to be able to do that not only to re-record it but to produce and mix it um i mean well dude <laughs> hold, hold on Hey, this is what I have to deal with. <laughs> Dude, stop ruining that. Get out of here. <laughs> my my vocal booth back here is like made of a material that's perfect for cats. I think it's like a scratch pad and I'm like, oh man. So I had to buy some like anti cat scratching tape that I'll put on that and then he'll probably just move over to the next part. But um, so producing, producing it was... Uh, it was cool. It was a it was a large task. Obviously, uh, when you take on any record, you know you're starting from nothing, and it's just you have to build the tracks. Uh, it's very very time consuming. Um, typically, when you go into making a record with a producer, a producer is going to have their team. They're going to have their engineers. They might have interns, assistants. Um, the engineers will have somebody that can help them edit stuff. Um, I didn't have an assistant, an engineer or anything. I was, I was all of that. So uh, I had to edit everything. So it was very time consuming, but uh, it was a, a really cool thing to do. I think in the sense of, I, I think 
just more so proving myself in like the music industry as a producer. Um, I think what got me to this point was doing the Alonia album with my wife. You know, we did that on our own. Same thing. We re recorded that here. And when we put that out, I think people, even in my surrounding, in my circle, like from my band to managers, like hearing it going, wow, like, okay, uh, my production has obviously gotten to the point where I can compete with, you know, major albums that are being put out. My, you know, everybody has their own mixing style, uh, producers who do mix. So for me, it just, I think, just developed into, okay, I can take this on. Um, and we just started it. We went and we actually tracked all the drums first. And then, I mean, I just sat here uh, for months and edited and we recorded. The guys would come over, uh, Jinx would come over. We'd track guitars. Uh, he'd track violins here. Uh, he did some stuff from his, his studio in his home. And uh, it was just a collaborative, a collaborative effort. Andy came. I mean, he sang all the vocals and I think we did it. I want to say the clean stuff. We probably, he probably knocked all the vocals out in like three or four days. And then he came in, it took two days of doing screams. And then it was just a matter of mixing it, putting it together and, and doing the background vocals and everything. So it was a, a large task to take on, you know, essentially saying as the producer and engineer, I kind of took it all on as myself. Um, so I didn't have a team to help me edit and stuff. So it was very time consuming, but you know, it's always very rewarding. There, there can be times where you're kind of frustrated. You get a little bit fed up of like, oh, I'm so sick of editing stuff yeah. that's boring to do. But in the end, it's worth it to look back and now be able to listen to it and go like, wow, this is cool. It sounds really good. Yeah. And you guys released uh, one song off of the Restitch These Wounds, and that was Sweet Blasphemy. Yep. Uh, how has the reaction been for that song so far? Um, everything I've seen has been great. You know, everybody loves it. I think that was always a fan favorite song. Uh, you know, we played that one live for years and years. I don't know why it wasn't ever originally a single, but that was just one that people have always seemed to really, really love. So that's why we decided like, you know, it's a, it's a song that we've all loved too. And, and so we decided to put that one out first. And I think it's a great representation of, you know, what can be expected. That song in particularly doesn't have too many things that are really like different from the original. Uh, yeah. There are slight subtle things here and there. Um, and a lot of the tracks are that way where we didn't change a lot of stuff. It's just subtle things here and there. But then there are some tracks like Mortician's Daughter and Carolyn where people will hear and go, wow, this is obviously quite different. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what does it mean to have a strong fan base built around Black Hill Brides? Uh, it, it's... I have no words for it. You know, it's really something that's truly unbelievable. Uh, I'm very grateful to be sitting here 10 years later since the band kind of really like went off and, and started touring and everything, even over 10 years. And uh, very grateful that we have a career in music and that we get to keep doing this and that I get to have my own studio here with a, a cat back here trying to climb everything. <laughs> the jungle um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing to interact with the fans and, and I've been streaming on Twitch. Okay. There he goes. <laughs> I, I blocked that area so he couldn't get up there and he went up there anyway. Well, he, he wants to be part of the interview. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's really cool to be able to interact with people and, and know that it, like, you know, we started 10 years ago and 10 years later, we're still going, we're making a new album. Restitch is coming out, but we're already like well into, we have more than an album's worth of new material that uh, we're working for the record that'll come out next year. Yeah, and even that you guys can't uh, like say tour with Restitch These Wounds, you guys are still doing a virtual show at the Whiskey in August. How excited yep. are you for, to do that show? Uh, I'm very excited. I'm, I'm also nervous because I need to start rehearsing. I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna rehearse today. And then I'm dealing with cats and, and I've got like my, my Twitch schedule and we're working on new songs. So it's like, I, my, my schedule is pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just a little nervous because I know I need to sit down and, and rehearse the songs because there's stuff that we've never played before. And there's songs we haven't played since 2010. So I need to relearn them, even though we just did the re-recording. But a lot of that is like punching parts. You're not playing the song all the way through when, when we're tracking or recording yeah. in the studio. So I've just got to relearn it and it'll be fine. Uh, I'm just freaking myself out and, and creating stress on myself, but I know it'll be fine. Uh, but it's exciting. It's yeah. going to be interesting to play in an empty venue to cameras, knowing that there's more people watching than can even fit in the venue. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited to see it. I feel like it'll, it'll still be good. I feel like. Yeah, I think so.
Yeah, and you guys also added a new member to the band. So, like, how's Lonnie fitting in with you guys? Oh, he's fitting in great. I mean, Lonnie's literally, he, he's Canadian, so we, we always have, I mean, I guess it's a known thing. Maybe it's not. Uh, Canadian people tend to just be very laid back and just, like, the sweetest, nicest people. So <laughs> I, I can't speak for all of them. I know Bob Rock, when we did a record with him, he's originally from uh, Canada and, and lives in Hawaii. So he's, like, the best of both worlds, like a Canadian living in Hawaii, like, what? You can't yeah. be mad about anything, I guess. Um, nicest guy ever. And Lonnie's, Lonnie's a, a great dude. He's a very talented musician, and he's just like the most down-to-earth, sweet guy. I don't know. That's, that's yeah. all I can say. He, he's super yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah, and when you first met Lonnie, what was your first impression of him? Um, I thought we were definitely going to have to do something about his hair because I met him uh, when Andy came through on his Andy Black tour when he was through L.A. We went to the show, and – and uh, hung out a little bit after and, and talked to him. And, and then we met Lonnie and he had his big Afro thing. I didn't yeah. know he was going to be in Blackville yet at the time. But um, I, obviously Andy was ahead of that. Like, let's get a flat iron on that hair, buddy. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, actually the guy who cuts my hair ended up cutting Lonnie's hair and he really liked it. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, what was your last show in Mexico City like? Just being, um, you know, adding a new member to the band and just kind of like, what was it like as a whole? to be able to perform? Um, well, I think, I mean, that show, there was some stressful moments going into it. So uh, live, I use something called the Kemper Profiling Amp, which I don't know if you can see it. It's this little green box down here. You can kind of kind of see it, this yeah. thing down here. So we use those live. And basically, it's like, it's like it's a digital amplifier that captures profiles from real amps from before. And there's uh, MIDI outputs that do all the channel switching. So if I have a clean sound to a distorted, a lead sound, et cetera, um, it auto switches for me. And my mine got broken on the flight. So it got TSA, oh, no. like, I guess just smashed the case or I don't know what happened to it, but the case got smashed in and it broke my, my power knob to it that you turn it on. Like the thing would just spin all the way around and nothing would work. And they text opened it up and they're like, this thing's wrecked. So luckily the venue was able to get one, but then I had to load all my stuff on there and make sure all the MIDI switching was working. So all of that stuff was just basically out the window. It's already pre-set up, done before we go play a show or on tour. And I'm sitting there on the spot running behind our sound checks running behind because I'm sitting there trying to reprogram all my stuff uh, yeah. onto this loner Kemper that we had. So that was a little bit stressful in the end, everything worked out. We got it to work and uh, we played the show and it was amazing. Uh, it, it was funny to see, not funny, but like, I think we were all really excited for Lonnie even because, you know, he was a fan of Blackville Brides. He's come to our shows when we played in Vancouver and to find out that he was always such a big fan of the band and now he's in the band he was just ecstatic to to play and perform and and to be able to like look over and just see the biggest smile on his face yeah uh it, it almost it felt rewarding you know like of course we're all having fun and, and smiling stuff but uh to see somebody so genuinely excited and and unfortunately to to then have to go into thinking you're about to go tour for like the rest of the year and then coronavirus happened and, yeah. and shut everything down so he got like the one, the taste of the one show of what's to come. And then it's like, well, sorry, dude, you're gonna have to wait another year. <laughs> yeah. And do you have a favorite song to play live? Oh man. I get asked this all the time. <laughs> um, I don't, I, I wouldn't say it's my favorite, like my most favorite song. I, I wouldn't be able to just pick one. Yeah. Like and a it few can, favorites. Yeah. It could, it could vary from show to show just depending on how I'm specifically feeling that night. Um, some shows, you know, we can feel as like uh, technicality playing wise that like, oh, that was a great show, like played awesome. And then there'll be shows, you know, where sometimes we're just off a little bit and like can hit some wrong notes here. Though, you know, it's live, live playing. It's not going to be 100 percent perfect. Um, we you know we, we strive to do that, but sometimes it doesn't happen. So it could be something like personally, like in a solo, I could I could botch a note or hit one wrong note and nobody else will notice. But for me, I'm just like, oh, my God, I just ruined my show. Yeah. Like <laughs> um, and it'll take me a second to recover mentally from that. And be like, ah, everything's fine. Just you're good. Like, yeah, 
people aren't pointing and laughing at me, you know, it's like, <laughs> but that's like the feeling I get in that moment. I'm like, Oh no. Like that's yeah. to me, it feels like everyone's like laughing and pointing at me, but then I see that nobody is. So, um, uh, favorite songs, I would say shadows die is definitely one of my favorites just because it's a very dynamic song and has special moments in it. Uh, a lot of crowd interaction with that one too, with, you know, Andy getting people swaying their hands back and forth. Yeah. Um, in the end's always a, a favorite just because that's like, I think our biggest song. So everybody knows it. Uh, it's yeah. also kind of bittersweet because we always play it at the end of the show. So it's the last song and it's kind of like, okay, well it could either be if I'm having a bad show, like a good thing that, well, okay, it's the last song. And you know, for the, the last Mexico city show we played, it was like a, Oh man, we're already like finishing. Like I, I wish we could keep playing because it just seemed like the hour and a half went by. It seemed like it was 15 minutes. Yeah. So Yeah. And Those two of, are definitely two of my favorites. Yeah. And out of all the solos that you play, because you do like a fantastic job on like every solo in any Black Veil Bride song. Do you have a favorite oh, solo you. to play? Um, trying to think. There's so many of them. <laughs> uh, I really like the solo in When They Call My Name. That one's... I, I think I, that's one of my favorite solos I've written. It's really good. Um, also, we haven't played the song in many years, but I really like the solo in Resurrect the Sun as well. Mm -hmm. I think those are two of my favorites. Yeah. And out of all the shows that you played, do you have any uh, embarrassing stage moments that have happened to you? Hey, what are you doing, dude? Knocking stuff over. Um, didn't even realize he was up there again. Uh, embarrassing moments. I mean, yeah, there's been things that have happened throughout the years, like having uh, a drunken Matt Good jump up on stage and I don't realize where he is on stage and he's like riding or Andy jumps up on his shoulders and then they run into me and <laughs> smash me into like, this is many, many years ago when we uh, still had like monitors on stage and we weren't on in-ears yet. So I tripped over a monitor and took a tumble and like rolled and I'm in the middle of a song, like laying on my back, trying to get back up and realizing like, ow, my side hurts because I fell on something. Um, those moments happen. I think everybody has fallen over or smashed themselves in something on the stage or we've run into each other. And um, those are probably like the, the most embarrassing things. I don't, I don't really have anything too crazy other than that nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like to put the embarrassing moments aside, like you're a really good guitar player. So how did you get into playing guitar? Um, so when I was 10 years old, my dad gave me an acoustic guitar for my birthday and I wasn't really quite interested in it yet. Um, when I, when I was about 13, I remember riding the, the bus to school and there was one of the older kids that sat in the back had a guitar and it was an electric guitar. And I was like, Oh, he didn't have it plugged in or anything on the bus, but he was like playing and, and people were like really interested in it. And I thought that was kind of cool. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And we would have like, there would be talent shows at school. And, and I remember there was like a three piece band. They played a Nirvana song and they were rocking out. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like, uh, I wish I could be like doing something like that. And then I discovered Metallica and that kind of like, heavy metal like the the guitar playing like james hetfield made me i was just like i want to sound like that i want to figure out whatever he's doing and be able to do that and so i picked up that acoustic guitar that my dad gave me i pulled it out of the closet and i just started like i didn't know what i was doing uh, i didn't have youtube or anything to look anything yeah. up there there wasn't even social media back then it, i don't even know if we had i don't think we even had internet back then um and i just started like just trying to play the thing. And my dad came home from work and saw me doing that for a couple of days. You know, he didn't think much of it, but then he saw me like, I don't know, the third or fourth day in a row, I was just, I wouldn't put the thing down. And so he, he, my dad's a musician, he plays guitar, he sings and plays drums. So he showed me a couple chords and then I just kind of went with it. And then I ended up taking guitar lessons for about three months. And that just kind of built my foundation of, the basic idea of how to play guitar and the yeah. different things you can do. And I just kind of took it from there and went on my own. Uh, I'm not like great with theory or any of that. My mom did teach me uh, some of that. She taught me 
in, in the way that I guess I comprehended it, how to do harmony and theory in a way where I can learn how to play, I can play a lead guitar part and then figure out the harmony and everything. But mostly, I mostly just play by ear. I have, I guess, a, a pretty good ear. So um, I just, I play and figure out what I think sounds good. Yeah, and at what, at what point did you decide that you want to be in a band? At what point? Um, I mean, I would say probably when I was 13, uh, I, I, I started playing. I realized that, like, this is what I want to do. Um, because before that, I actually wanted to be a, I wanted to go into the Air Force and become a fighter pilot. And when I was 13 and I started picking up guitar, and especially when I got my first electric guitar, which was just a very cheap one. But when I started, when I got that, I was like, yep, this is what I want to do um forget everything else this is what i'm doing yeah and i just yeah so from a very young age yeah and how did yeah. you meet the rest of the guys in the band um so i actually i've known i've known i guess i could say i've known of tc longer than anybody uh so i was in a band uh before uh, out here in la we worked with actually recorded cc's other band that he was in at the time and he had just done an album uh, like that the producer we were working with did a full album with CeCe's band that he was playing drums in. And so we had kind of like met through that, basically just being involved and working with the same producer. So we, we both knew of each other. And then just a, a mutual friend, like I was going through a period, like I was in this band, I wasn't in that band anymore. And I was writing and demoing my own music, which ended up becoming the first two Black Veil records. But during that time, I didn't have a band. I was just making all this music. And then I started to kind of go, well, I should probably start finding a band for this. And weirdly enough, uh, a mutual friend that knew Jinx and me actually called me up one day and was like, hey, uh, do you want to help me write some music for this thing I'm doing? I was like, yeah, sure. And, and met up with them. But I, I put two songs on a, I burned two songs on a CD. And he came and picked me up. I didn't have a car at the time. And, and I was like, hey, you should listen to what I've been up to and played it. And it just blew his mind. And he's like, oh man, you got to meet this, uh, my buddy Jinx, like you two would be scary together. And he literally called, called him up. We met that night, I played it for him. And literally the next day Jinx came over and I started showing him these songs and he's like, dude, he was in a band called The Dreaming at the time. And he's like, I'm so bored with my band. Like this, this is what I want to be playing. Like, this is cool. So we just started working together. That's how Jinx and I met. and then. Um, we kind of ended up starting to put together a band and we ended up getting CC playing with us too for a while. Um, but we couldn't really get like a, we didn't have the vocalist or anything. We didn't really have a vocalist and we didn't really have a bass player. And CC kind of like saw that, like, ah, I don't really know what you guys, you guys don't really have it together. So he kind of, uh, kind of stepped aside for a little bit. And that's kind of in the time when, uh, Jinx and I actually met Andy at some, uh, some, I wouldn't say it was a party. I don't know what it was. It was some like company's event and we just stopped by for like a few minutes and Andy happened to be there. And there was this other guy that I had known before that was there with Andy. And so he came up and started talking to us and that's kind of how we met Andy. And then, uh, Jinx started working with the band before I did. So that was the first time I heard the name Black Veil Brides. And I went home and I looked it up and I saw the Knives and Pens video and it had already had like two and a half million views. And I was like, wow, like that's a lot of views. Yeah. Um, and I listened to it. And I was like, okay, like it's interesting. Like it's cool riff stuff. Like cool. It's all right. It, like I'm down with it. And, but I, th about three months went by and then I didn't really know how much Jinx was involved in it, but he had been, working with them, like trying to write, like the, one of the, the old guys that was kind of in the band for like a couple months was a fan of Jinx and asked him to come help them write. And then, you know, three months later, Jinx is asking me like, Hey, you know, that band, remember that band, that guy we met, uh, Black Veil Brides, like, would you be interested in, in writing some songs like for an album? It's like, yeah, of course. And, uh, that turned into literally demoing the first song that day. And, and little what I know at the time that, that one demo, two weeks later, I would have to do four more and then learn these other songs and I'd be going on tour two weeks from there, from that date. So, but that's what happened. So it was very quick, but yeah, that's kind of the, the rundown of how, how it all came together.
Yeah, and once Black Veil Brides kind of got going, and it was album after album, like, do you have a favorite album that you guys recorded? Favorite album? Um, I mean, every album was such a different process. Uh, the first two, obviously, like, you know, we had, I, I had so many demos and songs ready to go, so a lot of it uh, was basically, let's get some vocal melody ideas down on it and record vocals over these pieces I had already written. Uh, Set the World on Fire was a lot of that. Um, some of the songs we did in the studio, uh, most of it, though, was kind of, you know, uh, songs I already had musically put together. Um, I don't think it was my favorite at the time, but looking back, I think it's the album that taught me the most about songwriting and producing and and just really kind of opening myself, like opening my mind more uh, to different things and not being such a closed-minded metalhead, you could say. Uh, when we did Wretched and Divine with John Feldman, um, John Feldman and I butted heads for sure uh, at, at the beginning. And I think it was just like kind of a thing of, he he's a, a very vocal producer and I felt like he didn't care about the music. And I'm somebody who was like, I want the music to go like this. And then he would like strip away my guitar riffs and just put in like palm muting chords. And I'm like, no, like, what are you doing? So we would butt heads a lot. But in the end, the product, you know, the, the end result, when we finally got there, uh, I think that that record's one that, you know, speaks volumes. And I think that one's probably definitely a fan favorite. Um, Set the World on Fire is a great record. I love that one. Um, and... I mean, they all had their special moment, you know? I was a huge Metallica fan. Uh, so making a record with Bob Rock, maybe it's not my favorite record we've done, but I think that the Bob Rock record might have been the one I had the most fun doing, just as like an audio engineer nerd standpoint of view. Uh, it was really cool for me to get to make a, an album with the guy who made the album that made me want to play guitar and, and go, how the hell do you get that guitar tone? So I got to do it with the guy that did that. Uh, so that was kind of like a a cool moment in my life. Um, and then we did another album with John Feldman that, you know, I got to co-produce with him. Uh, I think, I think honestly the, the newest one, uh, not restitch these wounds, but like the, the actual new album that will be coming out next year, I think will probably end up being my favorite, probably just because for the most part it's new, but, um, I'm going to get to produce this one as well. So. Yeah, and uh, what can fans expect from this new album that you guys will be releasing? Oh, I think overall it's just the, the best songwriting we've ever done. Uh, I think the melodies are the catchiest they've ever been. Uh, it's we're, we're working on a concept album again, so there's going to be a, a whole story to tell. It's going to take people on an, an adventure. And we're starting to kind of think outside the box and do things that we normally wouldn't do, kind of bringing in elements from Wretched and Divine where we have weird moments in songs or these big grand uh, moment, uh, you know, I don't know, five and a half, six minute long songs. Uh, of course, we want to have those big in the end type songs as well with the big, you know, hooky choruses. But um, overall, we, we are just going to over overwrite and then kind of compile it down to what makes sense on the record. So we're writing right now, like I said, we already have over an album's worth of material, but we're just going to keep working through the end of the summer and then kind of listen back to everything we have and go, okay, what's the story here? How does it all play together and what makes sense to actually go on the album? And then uh, we'll start like the, the real, real production on there and start tracking everything for the final version. So it's going to be, I, I don't want to say it's going to be like a, a part two of Wretched and Divine because that's not the intention there, but it's going to be something that is not just here's another rock record of 10 songs it's going to be yeah. special i think yeah we're trying to bring something something cool different and uh special yeah and tell yeah. a story yeah. yeah thank you for coming on the show today jake yeah of course uh where can people find you on uh, social media social media uh i am at jake pitts bvb or most likely uh these days you'll find me on twitch at twitch.tv slash jake pitts that's my twitch channel Awesome. Thank you so yeah. much for coming on today. Yeah, thanks for having me.